A very good evening to all of you and welcome to Sikh Sanctuary's Green Carbon College Program 2022 lecture series. Today is the first of the lecture series and we begin with a warm welcome. Warm in the sense that global warming has created a lot of furore amongst people's minds, lives and societies to teach them more and more about what is happening around us. We have today Ritu Raj Fukan, I call him Raj Fukan. A very quick introduction to him because his otherwise bio data is extremely long and you can see a lot of things that he's doing on Facebook as well. Ritu Raj Fukan is an environmental writer, adventurer and a naturalist based out of Assam. He is the founder of the Indigenous People's Climate Justice Forum and also serves as the vice president of the US-based Grassroots Coalition for Environmental and Economic Justice. He is a member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature and sits on the board of civil society groups in the Americas, Europe and Australia. Rituraj has personally experienced the impacts of climate change in the polar frontiers of the Arctic and Antarctic, in the Himalayas and across India. Having worked extensively at the grassroots, he says water is the local issue of global climate change for people and for biodiversity. Rituraj was personally trained as a climate reality leader by Nobel laureate Al Gore and was featured in the former US Vice President's 2017 book, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. He authored the chapter, Biodiversity in a Warming World, in the Amazon's number one bestseller, Climate Abandoned, a book launched in the USA on the Earth Day 2019. He was an accredited observer at the UN Climate Conference COP26 in Glasgow in November 2021, and has recently been selected as a European Climate Pact ambassador. I don't think you could have another better person to talk about the local and global perspectives of climate change. May I request all of you to keep your mic on mute and allow the speaker to speak. Respect the speaker. Later on, he will throw the forum open for all of you to ask questions. Over to you, Rituraj. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Parvisi. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, for the inaugural talk for Sikh Sanctuary's Green Carbon. And I will quickly share my screen. Uh, it is a huge uh, subject, uh, global and local perspectives of climate change. And so I will have a slideshow that will uh, be about uh, 35 to 40 minutes. So please bear with me. Uh, we will walk through a lot of the global uh, impacts and consequences as well as solutions and uh, look at uh, the latest IPCC report as well as uh, some of the youth uh, perspectives as well. So let's uh, start this slideshow. Uh, my favorite photograph, the blue marble uh, from the last Apollo mission taken from somewhere between the earth and the moon. Uh, this uh, photograph is perhaps the most widely shared uh, reproduced photograph and uh, it kind of marks the start of the modern environment movement in the 19, early 1970s with the start of the Earth Day as well as the uh, World Environment Day. So uh, lately I have been doing these presentations with a weather report and uh, because we need a global perspective, let's look at the uh, Southern Hemisphere first. Uh, last month, the Australia and the South America both recorded some of the uh, highest temperatures, respectively. Uruguay, 44 degrees Celsius, and Australia passed 50 degrees Celsius, which is not for the first time. The 1st of January, in fact, for the Northern Hemisphere, again, although it was winter, uh, there were record temperatures, and there were record anomalies within the continent itself. Uh, there were about 115 degrees difference between temperatures in the uh, North American continent and across Europe as well. 
uh, Eastern Europe had very low temperatures, whereas uh, Western uh, Spain and Italy had some uh, very warm temperatures as well. So how did I become an activist? My uh, first uh, act of climate activism was in support of the Pacific Warriors Day of Action. Uh, and tomorrow, the 2nd of March will be the ninth anniversary of uh, this actually. So uh, representatives from 15 Pacific small island nations who will be uh, submerged by rising sea waters uh, observed it this day with 350.org and uh, I happened to be on this expedition and uh, the Sanctuary uh, Nature Foundation and Sanctuary Asia founder uh, Sir actually uh, asked me to do the solidarity uh, act from Antarctica so this is what made me a climate activist and uh, the huge tabular iceberg that you see on top is actually uh, remains of the Larsen B ice shelf, which start, uh, which broke away from Antarctica uh, back in 2002, when not many people believed in climate change. And 11 years later, uh, these huge uh, icebergs were still floating in an area called Antarctic Sound. And so it was quite overwhelming to witness a part of Larsen B ice shelf. The entire year last year uh, was considerably warm. In fact, every month had temperature anomalies which set new records. Uh, and uh, all of that is, of course, due to us, uh, human development activities, we can say, and we are adding about 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the thin shell of our atmosphere every 24 hours. This is equivalent to a Hiroshima-class atomic bomb going off uh, uh, every hour, every day on the planet. Uh, this is a bad analogy in the time of war, but that's the truth. It's a big planet, but that's a lot of energy we are putting into it. And uh, most of the uh, greenhouse gases, we kind of uh, attribute to coal, which is the largest polluter, but other activities, including food production, uh, forest burning, industrial agriculture, uh, land transport, all of these contribute to the carbon accumulation. Uh, Towing permafrost is emerging as one of the main concerns, especially for methane, and uh, uh, that is going to be the focus areas for a, a lot of countries in the coming years as well. So the largest source of uh, uh, global warming pollution is, of course, the uh, burning of fossil fuels, and this graph makes it quite clear that all of it has happened since the Industrial Revolution and has accelerated in the past 50 years or so. Uh, that is about the same time as the environment movement uh, actually um, started to happen. Uh, 2021 has not been added to this list, but that is actually the warmest uh, year. So that uh, the official declaration will be made very soon. And uh, as you see, the last seven years has been hottest and you can make that last eight years now in a row. You remember the um, IPCC report published on August 8th last year, which was termed as a code uh, read for humanity. That was the working group one report, uh, look, which looked at the physical science basis. And uh, really that was a record breaking summer uh, for the entire planet, which record uh, temperatures over 50 degrees from many, many countries uh, and especially in Asia. India already had the record temperature about six years back, uh, 51, point, uh, 51 degrees Celsius. So where does this extra heat go? Thankfully, 90% goes into the oceans, but that is creating more problems. Not only is it causing uh, trouble for marine life, but uh, many of the storms and hurricanes that we hear about are uh, getting more powerful because of these, uh, because, uh, because the surface temperatures have increased in the oceans. Uh, but this is just an example of Hurricane Tukte. Uh, there have been so many uh, in the cyclone season. Uh, we we had some record uh, four or five cyclones last year in the U.S. Uh, and uh, that is unprecedented. In fact, uh, all these extreme weather events are now happening about four times more than they used to. 
uh, just uh, a few decades back. India, of course, is ranked among the top uh, 10 worst affected countries. And uh, in terms of dollars uh, or in terms of costs as well, it is seventh on the list. And because of three critical factors, India's uh, risk is uh, more. And one of them is high agricultural dependence. The thir uh, third is high fossil fuel dependence and also long coastline, which makes us vulnerable to sea level rise as well as all the cyclones and storms. So what are the impacts that we are already uh, seeing? If you, uh, any of you have looked at the IPCC Working Group uh, 2 report, which was released yesterday, uh, there is a section on Asia and a lot of uh, focus is on uh, India as well. Uh, and uh, one of the scary lines that is said is that many parts of the country will become uninhabitable uh, if we were to continue on this same pathway. For many of us, uh, the climate change, by definition, is a disruption of the water cycle. And, uh, and the same extra heat that uh, absorbs, that evaporates more water from the ocean is actually sucking out uh, more moisture from the soil. And so we are having this prolonged and extended droughts. And uh, that is a concern for India uh, because the groundwater levels are going down. Uh, we are seeing wetlands disappearing and a lot of rivers are running dry. And uh, in the past few decades, uh, about 40 to 50,000 farmers have committed suicide uh, because of this drought. More than half of our country is uh, extremely water stressed. Uh, and uh, you do not see the Northeast here, but uh, in fact, the Northeast is again facing uh, potential water crisis in the future. And we'll come to that. Uh, in terms of uh, over pumping aquifers, India is among the worst performing countries. A few years back, we saw these headlines from the Niti Aayog itself, uh, the worst ever water crisis in history. And now look at these headlines. Please do not come to Shimla. Locals plead to tourists. Washing is a privilege. And there were others. I remember uh, there were appeals by the government to stop uh, using water during the Holy uh, Festival as well. Uh, I find some of these figures really astounding. As 95% of the wells have dried up uh, in Tamil Nadu, uh, water tables are falling 20 feet uh, every year in, in parts of Gujarat. And uh, uh, now this is a data-driven map that was published a few years back. And uh, it looked like it looked at uh, the likely areas of the world where water wars may happen in the future. And I, for one, was surprised to find uh, Ganga, Brahmaputra uh, Valley mentioned here as well, because currently um, Assam or uh, Bihar and many of the states in this region, West Bengal, are known for the floods. We have an abundance of water, if you can uh, say that. But in the future, the projections are that uh, this is where we will see water wars. And uh, that, again, was confirmed by other assessment. This was actually the first ever assessment of uh, climate change over the Indian uh, region published last year. Uh, we had the, the confirmation of warming in the Hindu Kush Himalayas, which is already one point three degree uh, in the last 60 years. And, uh, and, and uh, summer heat waves are projected to be three to four times higher by the end of this century. Uh, there was another report which uh, uh, was published in January 2019. And uh, this is of great interest to me because uh, the, it concerns the Hindu Kush Himalayas and the Eastern Himalayas. And uh, this is very critical because about 40% of the global population are dependent on the Hindu Kush Himalayas, the water tables of Asia. Uh, the most populous countries of China, India, Bangladesh, we all depend on water from the rivers that originate here. So uh, these predictions are quite dire for the entire region. Now, I always say that water is the local issue of global climate change for people and for biodiversity. We heard that before. Uh, 
just uh, out of curiosity, I found this uh, headlines uh, from a few years back, tigers killing elephants in fierce water war. We do not know what is happening inside our forest, to be uh, frank, uh, to be honest. And, uh, and in Delhi, and the monkeys are killing each other as well. Uh, this is happening in other parts of the world. About 200 elephants died uh, two, three years back because of drought. Uh, in India as well, the elephants, you know, they are actually very sensitive to heat stress. They need about 200 liters of water. Uh, they are also very temperamental. And uh, uh, I have been working with elephants for a long, long time, trying to mitigate conflicts and facilitate coexistence. One of the things that I'm seeing is that their habitat in the foothills is overrun by uh, in their ship shrubs and creepers, uh, which uh, covers the uh, existing grasslands and then they uh, tend to come into uh, paddy fields and human habitation and that con creates conflict and that is true for other animals as well like rhinos for example. Uh, in ecology there's something called the Goldilocks principle just like life exists on earth because the conditions are just right it's not too hot not too cold uh, species surviving the particular area because the bioclimatic envelope is correct for them and if that changes they tend to move away and the new ipcc report actually um, confirms that reiterates uh, that many many species around the world have been recorded to be moving from the uh, equator and towards the pole for example in the southern hemisphere the the purple sea urchin uh, the zooplankton and the whale shark three photos you see on the top uh, have been all uh, recorded to be migrating towards the South Pole. Uh, these are all marine animals. And in the Northern Hemisphere, these terrestrial animals like the blue Argus butterfly, the, the, the pika and the, the septis warbler, these are all terrestrial animals in the Northern Hemisphere, which have been documented to be uh, slowly migrating polewards towards the North Pole. Uh, but not all animals can, of course, migrate. Uh, one example was the shifting of the colony of emperor penguins in Antarctica, uh, the, where the movie March of the Penguins was shot. That colony has itself shifted uh, further and further south, but there is a limit to how far they can go. Uh, similarly, in India, uh, tigers have been documented uh, to be following their prey, but uh, because their habitat is changing. For example, uh, if the deer moves away from a particular area where the grass no longer grows, it's difficult for the tiger to follow because they are very territorial and there will be other big cats. It may be another tiger or it may be a leopard and, and that will lead to a clash and a fight unto death. The nature of the existing tiger habitat is, uh, themselves are now changing and becoming less uh, fruitful for them to survive. Uh, again, an example of uh, something that's happening, uh, a few years back, Nepal was afraid of losing their rhinos to India because they were following the grass line and that was shifting slowly to the south towards India. And uh, all these changes are happening within our, uh, within our protected areas as well. In Assam, for example, uh, rhinos, just like elephants, they all survive on the same grass. And if they wander away from the protected areas, it makes them vulnerable to poaching and then uh, conflicts with people as, as well. My interest in biodiversity impacts of climate change was uh, uh, evoked during the Paris Agreement around the time when I uh, came across this report called The Messengers, what birds tell us about threats from climate change and solutions for nature and people. Uh, in fact, uh, I was working with bird conservation with the Great Red Chitin Stork and uh, their colony uh, had slowly disappeared, uh, slowly uh, for us, but I think in, in terms of uh, uh, history, they disappeared quite rapidly because within 10 years, uh, entire colonies were gone. And we were wondering what made them shift because the nesting trees were still there. Uh, of course, now we, I understand that a lot of uh, native variety of fishes that they used to feed on have also disappeared. There have been no studies to confirm that, but we hope there will be soon. Uh, but this report actually talked about all these issues, about uh, shifts uh, towards the poles, towards higher ground, 
uh, disrupted interactions between predators, competitors, and prey, uh, mismatches in timing of migration, breeding, food supply, all this. Uh, another thing that came, uh, uh, came to my mind is that a few years back during the winters, well, while driving, we had to stop and wipe our uh, windshield of insects that would stick to that. Uh, every few kilometers. And now we do not have any insects and uh, that has also caused a lot of bird species that survive on this uh, to, to disappear. In fact, the entire vegetation change that is happening on our planet is affecting wildlife habitats, it is affecting uh, the biodiversity, it is affecting indigenous peoples whose lives are dependent on these biodiversity around them. And uh, it is basically uh, causing great uh, discomfort to the future of uh, human well-being and uh, this is something that scientists are increasingly referring to uh, about 50 percent of all land-based species might disappear within this century uh, this is the slide from the report published yesterday the working group two impacts adaptation and vulnerabilities uh, part of the sixth assessment report so if we have 1.5 degrees celsius rise in temperatures above pre-industrial levels, or if we have three degrees Celsius rise, the greatest impact will be on people as well as on biodiversity. And you can look at the loss of biodiversity. In some areas, uh, we'll see 75% to 100% loss of biodiversity. And these are uh, perhaps uh, among the biodiversity rich areas. And that uh, orange color 50 to 70%, again, uh, areas where a lot of uh, endemic biodiversities are found. So we cannot afford uh, to see temperature rise beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, the sixth assessment has also reiterated the fact that nature is critical. We cannot think about climate change mitigation without thinking, without talking about or without planning for biodiversity conservation. And uh, they have again pointed out the kind of services that nature provides us. Uh, so climate regulation is something that has been talked about increasingly as well as human health. And uh, we all know uh, with the pandemic that uh, biodiversity and uh, how humans interact with them uh, is a cause of great concern uh, for the future with so many unknown, so many thousands of viruses lurking there underneath the permafrost in the Arctic. And then so many uh, diseases have already jumped from humans, uh, from animals to humans. And the possibility that new ones are waiting uh, to affect uh, you know, human populations because of increased interactions. So this is the virus, the threat of virus is the greatest uh, health threat that humanity faces. Uh, yeah, I wrote the biodiversity impact chapter in this book. I thought I'll just put the link so if anybody want to oh, go in depth into uh, more of these consequences, you're welcome to read this. So now let's look at some of the solutions that we have. And uh, the most important part of the solution is that uh, the belief that we can do it. Uh, many people are alarmed by what is happening and they, they are pushed into a, a, a sense of numbness, uh, thinking that nothing can be done. But uh, scientists have now increasingly pointed out uh, that uh, if we stop emitting CO2, and then it will take as little as three to five years to start seeing the results. And Dr. Michael Mann, of course, is one of the most respected uh, professors. Uh, I had an interview last year published with him uh, after his new book, The New Climate War, which actually looks at alarmism as a deterrent to climate action, was published. So what is the progress in terms of uh, transition? In 2000, uh, worldwide wind capacity was projected to increase uh, by 30 gigawatt in 10 years. In reality, in 2020, that was exceeded 24 times. And uh, this is how the graph looks. This is what we want to see happening. Uh, wind energy capacity has been growing and India uh, is one of the countries where a lot of progress has been made. Similarly with solar energy, the projections 
uh, were quite uh, uh, optimistic, but we exceeded that by many, many times, uh, 132 times by 2020. So this reality is what gives us hope. Uh, some, some people ask uh, what is the potential of uh, the solar energy to power our planet. Just one hour's energy, if we are able to harness it, uh, store it and use it, distribute it to where it is required, can meet the, uh, the entire year's uh, energy requirements for the whole earth. So, and that is reflected in the growth of jobs in the sector as well. Uh, just a few graphs to show how the progress is happening in terms of solar and wind. India, by the way, was one of the pioneers during the Paris Agreement with the International Solar Alliance and uh, again uh, leading the world with uh, perhaps the uh, cheapest new electricity uh, around uh, the world will be coming from renewables in the next uh, few years. So this is uh, India where uh, solar power became cheaper than power from coal. Uh, electric transition buses, uh, trucks, all are going to be electric uh, powered very, very soon. And this change is happening right uh, uh, before our eyes. Even in Assam where I live, uh, a lot of electric buses are on the roads already. So these are uh, reflecting the change, the transformative change we are seeing on, in our lives. Uh, uh, one of the most important issues, of course, is climate uh, literacy and climate education. Uh, this is a project that I am involved with, subject to climate, where we uh, help teachers integrate climate change education with whatever subject they're teaching, be it mathematics or history. And uh, we have existing lesson plans, and, and students will also found it very, very useful with uh, a lot of news articles and blogs that are student friendly. So have a look at it, uh, it might be very useful for what you are doing. Now let's go back to the Paris Agreement in 2015. Uh, this was the first agreement uh, signed between countries, uh, first agreement on climate change and uh, the US left the agreement and then joined, rejoined it last year. And this year we had the, uh, sorry, in November last year we had COP26 at Glasgow uh, and the Glasgow Climate Pact. I was there on the streets, part of the protest, as well as negotiations during uh, all this uh, interviews. And uh, when it looked like we'll not have a good agreement, we actually walked out with a red rope around a venue. And uh, uh, thankfully, uh, finally, we had some kind of an ag agreement. So what were the goals? The first goal was to secure a global net zero uh, pledge or to keep 1.5 degree limit within which I think we reached that. And uh, the reason for hope is that we, all the countries of the world will go back to every COP uh, this year, uh, to every COP in every year now. So instead of going back every five years with improved emission targets, we are going to see countries uh, submitting new emission targets in COP27 this year and COP28 next year. A second, adapt to protect communities and natural habitats. Uh, this COP, again, I mean, the last year's COP, COP26, was the first time that uh, UNFCCC had 28 representatives from indigenous communities in the negotiating table. And uh, this was known as a uh, nature based COP, a forest COP with prioritizing nature protection and uh, talking about the links between the interlinks between biodiversity and climate action. Uh, third target was to mobilize finance. I think we failed miserably in that because uh, there was not enough talk about loss and damage, although adaptation funds were doubled. And third, uh, the fourth one was work together to deliver. And uh, that is something that uh, the UN FCCC ensures every time. So these were the official outcomes. Uh, I would say the most important was that it was the first global commitment to phase down use of coal and phase out fossil fuel subsidies. This COP also made the uh, Paris Agreement operational with adoption of the rule book. So 
this was um, a, a very important uh, COP and the Glasgow Climate Pact uh, will be uh, a landmark set uh, in this global climate negotiations. Uh, besides the official pact, there were other uh, announcements. And I think one of the most important was ending deforestation, which was signed by about 100 countries. Uh, the methane pledge, again, over 100 countries signed the, this agreement to cut down uh, methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Not quite enough, but a huge beginning because this was the first time that they talked about cutting down on methane. And, you know, methane is connected to uh, animal agriculture with uh, most of the emissions uh, coming from uh, factory farming of uh, livestock. So it is a big issue. And then there were agreements on nature, people, and planet, which was also uh, quite uh, useful for the global efforts to align biodiversity and climate change targets. Uh, I have a few uh, pages from the new report published yesterday. The science is clear. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. Uh, and this report also offers solutions to the world which can be adapted quickly. Uh, a few years back, the IPCC gave us a window of only about 12 years, and now three or four years have already gone by. So that window is really rapidly shrinking. Uh, it is very necessary that we start to put in more efforts in adaptation because communities who contributed little, very little to greenhouse emissions are at the front lines of climate change. They are suffering the worst effects and they're not uh, being able to do anything about it. So it is critical that uh, adaptation and loss and damage funds are made available to communities at the grassroots where the impacts are most uh, been felt. Similarly, at the same time, we also need to ensure that the focus is on cutting down emissions. A lot of uh, people are not talking about offsets and uh, uh, funds to get out of this climate crisis, but without cutting down greenhouse gas emissions, uh, nothing else will work. Uh, a few years back, uh, Antonio Guterres came out with this statement. I think it is very, very important for young people to take leadership of the environmental movement like they have always done so in the past. And I'm going to look at those slides now. But uh, uh, I remember Bitusa saying similar uh, things about uh, how our generation has failed to respond properly to the dramatic challenges of uh, not only climate change and biodiversity conservation as well. So young people are very right to be angry. Uh, back in 1992, it was 12-year-old Severn Kale Suzuki who silenced world leaders for five minutes. And this video, if you have not seen it, must be seen. And some of these words ring um, all the time. You know, every time I need to get inspired, get motivated, I go back to what she said. And these are incredible words. Uh, and she was just 12 years old. Uh, Felix Fink Beiner was only nine when he started Plant for the Planet. And uh, his tagline was trees for climate justice. And his aim was to plant 1 million trees. Uh, within a year, he was able to achieve that target. And at, uh, and, and in, at this moment, I think his uh, group, Plant for the Planet, is present in every country in the world. And they have already planted more than uh, 100 million trees. We had our own nine-year-old, Ridima Pandey, who filed a petition uh, with the NGT for not complying with the Paris Agreement commitments. Uh, she has continued her efforts and she was one of uh, the signatories along with Greta Thunberg uh, to file a lawsuit at the UN Convention on Rights of the Child uh, a couple of years back. And of course, the most famous uh, school strike for climate, Greta Thunberg, um, I was fortunate to hear her uh, speak with so much of passion and uh, knowledge and uh, it gives me great hope about uh, the future of the planet because all these young people, they are so informed and so passionate about uh, ensuring that their future and our future generations are not compromised any further. 
uh, when COP uh, COP26 ended and we all came back home, uh, this artist called Stewart Paddock put up this sculpture, the Hope sculpture. I think it represents uh, optimism for human humanity's response to climate uh, crisis. And uh, this is something that I'm going to leave, up, uh, leave you with. And the last slide, of course, is uh, we all must not make the mistake to think that we are trying to save the planet. We are only trying to save ourselves, the human species. Uh, the planet existed long before you came on board and uh, the earth will always be there even if uh, our species were to disappear. So thank you very much uh, once again and uh, I'll stop sharing so that we can interact.